Welcome to episode 17 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. We're here at the Creative Pro Expo featuring Mac World Live and Linux Live Expo thing. And I'm here with Dave. Hello. What have you been doing the last couple of days? I've been standing manning the Ubuntu stand and telling people about Ubuntu. Okay, and Alan's here as well. What have you been doing the last couple of days? Handing out CDs, answering technical questions, as much the same thing as Dave, really. Excellent. And I've been doing pretty much the same thing, handing out CDs, answering technical questions and talking to people about Ubuntu. So basically, when you asked me what I did, you actually knew what I did. Yes, because I've been here stood here next to you. Yeah, and the listeners didn't. That's why we do, that's why we do this whole what are you doing thing. It's for the listeners, I know. Dave. I know. So what we've been here, we've been talking to a few people from some of the projects that have had stands here, usually in the .org village, which are sort of the open source, non-commercial type stands. Which projects have we interviewed people from? Debian, OpenNMS... Joomla and Postgres or PostgreSQL as we're supposed to call it apparently sounds like a fun packed show Alan and I are here with Ryan from the Joomla project Ryan what's Joomla? Joomla is an open source content management system that allows you to manage the content on your website so that you don't have to worry about dealing with code the basics of Joomla allows you to create pages on the site and edit pages But as it's grown over time, it allows you to do more than that. You could even enter in things like photo galleries, event systems, a whole lot of stuff beyond just editing pages on your site. So is there like a basic Joomla package and then is there like a a concept of extensions and add-ons you can add for like photo gallery or whatever? Yeah, the, the concept we have as a development team is to start with building a strong framework. That framework includes with it one very popular component we call, called the content component, that you get just from downloading Joomla from our website. Beyond that, we have an extension system that allows you to extend Joomla to do everything from photo galleries to podcasting to whatever your needs might be. I would say that the unique thing about Joomla and a couple of the other more powerful open source CMSs is that they've gone beyond just publishing content and by having more modular constructions of their framework uh, have allowed groups anything from government organizations to candidates for political office to nonprofits and companies, a whole variety of audiences can use uh, Joomla and publish it not just for content, but even just to have, say, events. I know organizations that are using it just to publish events, and they're not even using the main content component in Joomla. One issue I've seen with um, some content management systems is that someone can install one and put their content up. From a visitor's point of view, it's very easy to spot that it's a a site made in a particular engine. How do you um, make your site... Uh, if you're using Joomla, stand out from the others. The number one thing we tell folks that they're trying to make their site look different from the Joomla mold, let's say, is to not think about Joomla when you're going through the design process of making your site. Think about the design, think about your audience, figure out what they want, and then design to that. After you've created your design, if you're lucky enough, you've got a designer or you can use Photoshop yourself, and you're slicing it up, then think about how it needs to be integrated into Joomla. By making sure the design comes first, you're going to do a much better job of breaking that mold of being, you know, the basic three column with bubbly modules. Uh, You're going to go well beyond just that. There are people out there who provide this service of customizing a Joomla installation to your look and feel, I guess. Yeah, we have a really robust uh, ecology of developers and designers and third party component and extension uh, creators. And the nice thing about that is when you have a community this large, you have specialists. So due to its maturity, you have people that just do template designs from scratch. You have people that just do extension development if you have a particular need that is not already met in the Joomla community. And just by the way in which we've tried to encourage the communities to grow, you found that there's a lot of diversity in those people uh, all around the world, actually. So you say it's a very well-established community. How long has Joomla been around? Joomla came about in August of 2005. It it technically is a fork of the Mambo project, but it's the most interesting of forks because the entire core development team left Mambo and went to Joomla. So we didn't lose anybody during that transfer. A lot of us call it a rebranding. Mambo had been around since about 2001, I believe. So the project and the the strength behind it have been there for at least seven years. Um, But since then, really in the last two to three years since Joomla became Joomla, uh, we've seen a huge change in that we went from a 
procedural framework to an MVC-based framework. So much more modular, a lot easier to write components for, and template designers love it because you get to write the HTML and the design output that you want. So why Joomla? What's the name for? Oh, the, Joom the name itself? Yeah. Uh, the name Joomla in, or the term Joomla in Swahili means community or coming together. Our foundation that runs the project, the nonprofit that runs the project, uh, is called Open Source Matters. And we really come from our strong belief that uh, open source and making sure that people are building the, the, the entirety of the Joomla system together is more important than having, say, one person uh, leading the development process. It does mean our development cycles might be a little slower than other open source projects, but we feel as though we get much stronger diversity and much more solid uh, of a code base because of it. And it's Joomla with an exclamation mark at the end, isn't it? What's that about? <laughs> yeah, I think what happened when we first uh, got the name is that if you add an exclamation mark to something, you have that punctuation and it's easier to make it uh, trademarkable in, in other countries. And because Joomla is actually a word in some other language, that could be interpreted in different ways of not being unique enough. Um, I think in general, though, you see the exclamation point uh, falling away quite often. <laughs> you, you mentioned the uh, development cycle that you, that you have. What are you currently working on for the next release of, uh, of Joomla? So we went from Joomla 1.0 series to now we're at Joomla 1.5. That jump was massive. We tell people that it's not just an upgrade, that's a migration. That's like going from Windows to Mac. Whole new world, great new framework. Now we're going from 1.5 to 1.6. 1.6 is focused a lot on access control list, ACL. And that has always been uh, an Achilles heel for Joomla. We all recognized it. And the idea that uh, you can prescribe the roles and responsibilities of users to objects like content items, events, whatever you might have, uh, has been something we've always wanted to do. But because we had all this new framework code that we were writing, we wanted to do that first make sure all the functions work properly, and then add this very strong layer of ACL. And that's the big push that we're doing in 1.6 right now. When's that due for release? Right that? now, in uh, open source world terms, <laughs> we're looking hopefully at a beta, I would think, by the end of this year, uh, and then maybe a more solid release in the first quarter of 2009. And obviously, I guess, for productive sites, you recommend people stay on 1.5 and try testing out 1.6 on development sites or something right. like that? Right. That's the best thing to do. The current version of the 1.5 series is 1.57. Most of the changes we've done uh, from 1.50 to 5.7 have been uh, security fixes or little bug fixes that we saw that were uh, important. Um, but we'd recommend keeping up with the 1.5 series. And then when 1.6 goes, uh, goes live, goes golden, uh, that would be a good time to, to move over. We always recommend developers and people that are, are really helping to do beta testing to install it as quickly as possible to help us out. Now, I understand you've got a Joomla day coming up. What's that all about? Yes, yeah, so what we do is we don't have a Joomla universe conference, you know, to bring people from around the world to one event location. Instead, we have simultaneous events uh, scattered across the year going on all over the world. Uh, we have one coming up um, in March of next year, March 15th uh, through 17th. Uh, it's about 30 miles uh, east, uh, I'm sorry, west of London. And I, I forget the name of the town right now, uh, but it's going to be a great event where people can come, bring their Joomla questions, meet with a lot of members of the core development team. There's probably going to be about 300 people or 400 people total there. And there'll be two tracks. There'll be beginner tracks, learn about Joomla, how to get your site up and running, and a second set of tracks that's more about for advanced developers, building code, helping the project out by writing new stuff, maybe even a code sprint or two to get some new stuff out the door uh, while we got the people there. So will people have to pay to get in? I think there is going to be a small fee. I would believe it's going to be under 100 pounds. But the nice thing about that is uh, we make sure to keep it as low as possible just to cover the basic costs. And anything that's left over uh, goes right back into the community to the Open Source Foundation to help out. Excellent. So where can people find out more about the Joomla Day? You can find it out uh, on the main website at www.joomla.org. And there's an events section there that you can learn more about the events happening uh, specifically here in the UK and then anywhere else in the world that you'd be interested in. WordPress, Drupal, Joomla. <laughs> Why Joomla over those? Gosh, that's the million dollar question. Uh, I've sat on enough panels at conferences next to clone and Drupal representatives. And after doing that panel about six times, we've really said it comes down to things like, what color do you like better, blue or orange? <laughs> and the reality of it is, I think it's a preferential 
opinion at this point. If you had a developer from Joomla and a developer from Drupal sit down and answer your question, say, can you make your system do this? We would always just say yes, and I'm sure there's some way we can both do it. The question that I think most audiences need to take into account is, what is your end user community like and, and how are they going to be interacting with it? What's more important, the UI and the user experience or the ability to dive in there and have a strong uh, framework to extend and, and build more code on? I think Drupal has its strength in a very strong developer community. I mean, their slogan is community plumbing. We come from a slogan that was power and simplicity. We're very end user focused. And so I think that those folks that are really looking just to, for a, a good interface to manage their website, Joomla is probably going to be right for them. Those developers that really want to get geeky and build a lot of extensions and new things, Drupal might be a good start for you right now. Of course, I think Joomla is good for everything. But <laughs> Excellent. Thanks very much for talking to us, Ryan. Thank you very much. Tony and I are here at the Expo with Simon Riggs from the PostgreSQL project. Sorry, I do say Postgres sometimes. Is that, is that wrong? Uh, is no, it official? Both, both are correct. We had a discussion about that and uh, both ways are fine. Historically, it's been known as Postgres uh, because the product was actually developed before the SQL language came out. Uh, so Postgres is actually more than 20 years old now, developed in uh, the States in a university. You're one of the key developers of the of the project. So. Yeah, that's right. I mean, in later years, obviously it's been going for 20 years. I've been developing uh, core features for the last five years now. We've been implementing quite a few enterprise level features into the product in the last few years, sort of recovery based features and performance and data warehousing features, that kind of thing. Would I be right in saying Postgres is a database that is comparable to you know, any one of the other databases? There, is there a kind of like reference that you would say it's like, you know, it's like MySQL, it's like MSSQL, it's like Oracle? We would probably it? say it's like Oracle. Um, a couple of main features that you probably need to know about Postgres. First of all, it's an SQL database, okay? but it's designed from the ground up for concurrency, so you can handle lots of different users all accessing the database at the same time. Postgres invented a feature called um, uh, multi-version concurrency control, which Oracle copied, and now everybody's trying to do as well. But the main feature of that is it allows uh, somebody to write some data at the same time that somebody else is reading the data and they both see a consistent viewpoint. So it's a very important technology um, and that's why I say it's like Oracle because uh, Oracle has that now as well. So. Is that in, in part related to the way in which objects are locked within the database to that's ensure? Correct, yeah. Um, it's a very uh, complex and clever scheme that we use so that um, one person sees a particular viewpoint of the data while somebody else is updating it. So as the first reader sees the data, they will continue to see the old version of it while they access the data, all the while, while the next person is actually updating the value. It sounds a little strange, but actually the effect when you have multiple people working on the database is to greatly increase uh, performance and accessibility because nobody ever has to wait for the other person. Yeah, they're, so they're all everybody gets on with their work without bumping into each other. So you don't you don't get so much of a deadlock situation that yeah, you might right, get. Yeah, deadlocks are a significant problem, but they also cause lock waits and that kind of thing. So a lot of uh, a lot of other database systems, when you issue a query you sit and wait for it and obviously if you've got a website sitting and waiting for an answer bad thing um, so that's why Postgres is very popular with uh, people building complex internet applications. Is there a reason for putting some of these enterprise features into sort of drive adoption in the enterprise field? Is it somewhere you'd like to see more Postgres <coughs> deployment? Um, well Postgres is already very heavily deployed across the world significant uh, number of uh, large telecommunications companies use it. Uh, it's very heavily used by uh, people building anything that requires lots of data because its other characteristic is it's very extensible and it supports a wide range of uh, data types. Uh, so for example we've got geographical information systems, uh, we've got extensible in index types, uh, we've got a full text search system that supports uh, searching in different languages uh, and a particular stemmer that allows you to define exactly the types of ways that it breaks down words so that you can c completely customise the way that's configured. So whether you're sort of searching you know, archaic 
library type texts or just modern chat room type text you can you can vary the types of things you search and store would you recommend it for people who are just starting out with databases perhaps they just want to set up a simple database back website is it, is it really some easy to pick up well it's an sql database which some people would say that means it's not easy to pick up but um, i think it's what you call a full strength database it's not really an entry level system but if you're using it with something like ruby on rails that hides the complexity of a database from you then it works with that but it will also work with more advanced systems where you're hand coding the queries um, and getting the most from the database it's a finely tunable engine which to some people means unusable but you know it's not microsoft access you know uh, probably 80% of the world's systems now on databases are written in Microsoft Access. But that doesn't worry us because probably 95% of the world's data isn't in Access. You know, so if you want to keep track of your Scout Club membership list, Microsoft Access is just fine. But if you want to do something real with large amounts of data for the business world, then Postgres is really suitable for that. Speaking of the business world, uh, in my real job, I deal a lot with companies that have large volumes of data. And I know it's very difficult when someone says large volumes of data, it's a very difficult term to quantify, but you know, multi-gigabyte, multi-terabyte databases, usually um, ERP systems, something like SAP that uses Oracle, uh, Microsoft SQL Server or Infinix. And I know in the business world, there's, there's sometimes this perception that there's a kind of hierarchy of databases and there's the Oracle and the SQL Server up, up the top. Down the bottom, there's MySQL. And I think sometimes I, people see Postgres nearer MySQL than Oracle. And is, is that a perception well, that you've seen and one that you're... I don't... I, don't I mean, I think there is a certain perception, and if forgive me for saying it, but I think then my SQL folk would like that to be true. Um, Postgres users tend to be quite a lot of my SQL users that, that say, you know, thank God uh, for Postgres. Uh, and then we also get quite a few Oracle users and SQL Server users as well, uh, who are obviously experiencing the, the license pressure uh, and looking for a system that's similar enough that they can move across because you've got things like stored procedures, the way transactions work, the locking, is all pretty much the same way that Oracle works and the transition is fairly easy uh, as a result. Um, so a lot of businesses come from, from that direction. I've worked with lots of people that have got um, you know, 100 gigabyte plus systems. I tuned a system in the UK for uh, that was at that time 275 gigabytes uh, and after uh, a day's tuning we got all of the queries on that to operate below 100 milliseconds access time and that was growing by like 10 gigabytes a month that's one system but I mean around Europe there's lots of systems in that class I'd have to say that that isn't the norm for Postgres but that's mainly because the distribution of most databases are actually 100, uh, under 100 gigabytes uh, I used to work for a, a large bank in the UK and 90% uh, of our systems were under 100 gigabytes. So we had big systems, but they just weren't all that big. Postgres can easily cope with, with hundreds of gigabytes of data. Now, administering databases can be really complex. You talk about tuning them and, and you know, tweaking various little options to try and get the most performance out of yeah. it. Developing one must be even harder. How, how do you get into developing a database? What sort of skills uh, do you need? <laughs> Well, you, you mean actually writing the code? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I mean, it's hard. I mean, I, uh, you know, my own background, I've been working professionally with databases uh, for more than 20 years. Um, so one of the good things about database technology is uh, some of the technology has stayed relatively the same over that time. Uh, and there's been academic advances in some parts of the theory, but it's not like... Ruby on Rails, you know, it's not like a framework that comes out year on year on year. You know, that, so it's meant that a lot of the things that we know in the database world, we can carry on learning and it's still useful. So, so literally things I learned 20 years ago are still relevant because relational theory and the theory of locking concurrency is, you know, you can buy textbooks on it and it's the same. So that, that helps. As to developing it, I mean... 
you know it's in C so you know if you can yeah basically once once you begin to know how things work I mean it's very modular as well so but the coding style in Postgres is is incredibly clean I mean our code's been inspected by the Coverity tool um, and the uh, the number of bugs per line of code was ten times higher uh, than sorry ten times lower <laughs> yes <laughs> get that one right um, than MySQL and I, so I hear that that was uh, ten times better than Oracle uh, so we had something like one bug per thirty thousand lines of code so the uh, the academic research community and databases all of their projects use Postgres you can read the papers on it they say you know we wanted to investigate this and we so we you know we took Postgres and we added this to it and and then they describe how it works and there's dozens of papers using Postgres and none at all as far as I'm aware using MySQL. You clearly have high standards in your coding style um, and it's a complex topic albeit it's been around for a long time does that make it hard for you to get new developers on board to uh, help or is that not something you've Um, had a problem with? Well I think the ones that we do have are very good they're very committed I think it takes a long time to learn some of the innards of the code base and I'd have to say obviously as we work on it year on year the code base gets more complex so you know that might be seen as a barrier but we get lots and lots of developers I mean most people are good for at least one patch whether it's a documentation patch or uh, you know some new function that does fills in a missing feature or rounds out the functionality in a particular area so there's, there's lots of people that are happy to uh, to submit those kinds of things. What's currently being worked on for the, the next version of uh, Postgres? Is there uh, any, any major things coming well, up? Definitely, yeah. We've got some very exciting features. Uh, the 8.4 release is just about to uh, have the final commit fest, which is um, a way of working where every two months we stop development and make sure all the patches on the queue are reviewed or committed. Uh, so we're just about to stop that and work towards releasing 8.4. But currently in this release, we've got recursive queries. Uh, we've got database level collation. Um, still on the queue is security enhanced Postgres. I'm working on something called hot standby that will allow uh, a system to run read-only queries against a server while it's in the, in the recovery state and also will allow very f- fast failover times. And there's quite a few other features in there that are, that are quite exciting. Uh, and of course performance kind of goes up as somebody said last release yeah we don't bother telling people about performance because it always goes up so, <laughs> so, when's that uh, due for release uh, that should be due for release in about March time uh, so uh, because of the process that we've followed in this release we think it'll take us about four months to sort of package it do the docs write the press releases that kind of thing and where can people find out more postcraseql.org the homepage there is uh, quite well designed with links and stuff uh, the documentation is quite incredible. Uh, a lot of people don't read it because they think it's open source, so it'll be rubbish. But actually, we've got 1,500 sides of A4 of really well-written documentation. Uh, when you print it out, it's uh, almost a foot thick now, so we don't print it anymore. <laughs> um, but it's uh, the documentation's got special sections where you can put questions or comments against the docs and we approve it every release we sort of feedback that information into the docs brilliant well thanks very much for joining us cheers tony and i are here with uh, taurus from the open nms project and i have to confess i have no clue what open nms is <laughs> so is there is there a potted what it is oh yes um we're a, an open source network management product our tagline is the uh, world's first enterprise grade open source network management platform. That's a marketing term. And so being a geek, I want to actually break down each one of those words. By World's First, we, we were founded in 1999. Uh, we were registered on SourceForge in 2000, around March of 2000. Uh, this is actually after uh, NetSaint, which became Nagios, which is probably the, the most well-known open source uh, uh, management tool. And uh, so we've been around about as long. We actually have a lower number now since Ethan had to change the name from NetSaint to Nagios. But uh, so, we, so when we say world's first, it doesn't mean necessarily world's best, although we think we are. But it, we have been around for a long time. Now, enterprise grade means that we were built to, design, to monitor tens of thousands of devices. 
I mean, we have one customer in Geneva right now that's monitoring 72,000 discrete devices with OpenMS. Uh, they're doing data collection as well as service monitoring on those systems. As you know, a lot of open source projects start out, someone has an itch to scratch. And so they go and they write a little tool that will monitor something or do something. And then they're like, oh, this is pretty good. I'm going to extend it to 10 devices. And then it grows and says, I want to extend it to 100 devices. Well, you run into problems going from, say, 100 to 1,000, 1,000 to 10,000, et cetera. We started out on day one trying to manage tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of devices. Now, as a management platform, um, we've built a lot of hooks so both proprietary and open code can plug in to our system. For example, you can send events in OpenMS with a, a, a Perl script or any kind of script you want to write. You just connect to a port and spill some XML. And um, so when we do our backups, we have a little rsync backup script that runs every night uh, to back up our internet servers to the local office. When it starts, it sends an event to OpenMS. When it finishes, it sends another event to OpenMS. If there's an error, it kicks back yet a third event, and then I get alerted should the backups fail and I need to fix it. And then open source, we're 100% free in open software. In the US, there's a big problem now. You'll hear the term commercial open source, and it means, I call it shareware, because it means, well, here's a bit that's open source, but if you want all these extra features, you have to pay for it. And in my mind, that defeats the purpose, because you can bet that those features that you have to pay for will never make it into the open source piece. And those are the bits that you really want. Exactly. And so we pride ourselves. There is a commercial company behind OpenMS that provides strictly services, support, training, that kind of thing. Um, but the software is and will always be 100% free. I could install a box, chuck OpenMS on it, and have it, would I need to do some obscure configuration of rack, uh, lots of text files to tell it where all my machines on my network are in the configuration, or is there some kind of nice, easy configuration to set it up to monitor my network? Um, one of the main things we, stro uh, we strive for with OpenMS is automated discovery. So um, what you would end up doing is going and adding our app repository to your sources list, doing an app get install OpenMS. Uh, it'll install, we require Postgres. We are written in Java. You know, some people were really upset. It's not a, it's not a servlet, well, you know. The interview it's not right an applet, now. excuse me. Yeah, it's not, it's not an applet. It is, it is a, a, a Java application that, that runs locally. So you, you install it. You have to make a few database changes to give us permission to talk to it. But then you, you simply pick a, a, an IP address range or whatever, hit go, go grab a sandwich, and we'll actually scan the network, discover devices on the network, add the services to the network. If things like SNMP are enabled, we'll do data collection automatically. You don't have to go through the configuration of applying this service to this node, etc. It just automatically happens. Does it do things like port scanning hosts to see if there's a web server or FTP server there? Exactly. Or um, we have a, a capabilities daemon within the code that'll go into test to see if SMTP is installed, HTTP, etc. So any service that's available that would be available to, from a user sitting on the OpenNMS box, we can test. Now, if you say you have a particular service that runs on a different port, you could actually go in through configuration and say, check to see if that port's open. Um, if you use Nagios and you have Nagios check scripts, you can run those using our general, so we have a general purpose monitor class. You can actually pull in Nagios. Yeah, you can, run, you can run check scripts natively on the OpenNMS box. You can talk via, uh, we're agent agnostic. We don't require an agent, we don't use an agent, but we can use um, uh, Nagios' agents, NRP, and NS client. We can use any kind of SNP agent that's out there. We use syslog to get events. So anything that you can pretty much think of, we try to, to grab that data source. But we go all the way up to true synthetic transactions. Um, you can. What, what does that mean? Well, suppose you have a, a web-based service that's important. We, in the U.S., you have to pay for your healthcare, and there's this very large healthcare provider in California that has centralized all of its operations in Oakland. So if you go to any one of their 350 doctors' offices or clinics, the doctor will open his laptop and access a web page, and he'll grab a, an application called eChart, which brings up your patient chart. If he can't access that, the whole operation stops. So we actually created a remote monitor. It's a little Java web start app that you can put on a Windows box or a Linux box or anything that runs Java. And it will talk to the main open NMS and monitor from the point of view of the clinic what's going on. And by monitor, we have this page sequence monitor. So the monitor goes to eChart, 
logs in with a dummy user and password, brings up a dummy patient, adds a diagnosis code, removes a diagnosis code, and logs out, and it checks every step of the way to make sure that there's no errors. If you just turn on OpenNMS, it'll say, oh, I, there's a web server running on port 80. Because we'll connect, we'll send a get, we'll get a formatted message back and say, oh, web server on port 80. Um, what we won't do is the page sequence monitor unless you configure it, because you've got to tell us what Every application is different. Right. So. so we try to make it simple, and out of the box, there's a lot you can do. But we call ourselves a platform because we're designed to be a Swiss army knife. Is there a concern that this thing's going around polling all these machines and placing additional load all over the place? Well, what I like to do is I'll, I'll turn on NetSNMP on the OpenNMS box, and then I'll monitor the interface traffic using OpenNMS. And it's usually, even on the large networks, you would be surprised at how minimal the traffic addition uh, is. Now, when we're talking like this company in Geneva that's monitoring 72,000 devices, yes, that's a very beefy box. We actually put the database on a separate box and we use a, uh, an EMC uh, SAN to store the data. I've got this thing discovering whether everything's there and checking the services are running okay. What, what reporting do I get? Well, it, there's a couple of different types of reports. We do the performance graphs so you can see historical data. We also have a very robust thresholding process. So not only can you do absolute thresholds, like let me know when my free memory gets below 100 meg, or let me know when the CPU is at 100%, or my disk is at 99, um, we can also do relative thresholds. So you know, if it suddenly increases or decreases by 20% for whatever reason, let me know. Um, we also come with a built-in notification system. So for every event that's generated, you can trigger notices. Uh, an email. Uh, right now, out of the box, we support emails, uh, SMS. We can do uh, XMPP. So if you have a Jabber, yeah. So both group, XMPP group, which is a chat room. So you can create a persistent chat room, and all your status just scrolls by, and people can join or leave. Uh, and you can also send to individuals. But the way it's structured, you can easily plug in any command you want. I have a customer in, in Singapore that has a, a. They have a third shift that tends to sleep. So if anything goes off during third shift, it actually sounds like klaxon. You know, it sounds like a siren that he uses uh, uh, using uh, uh, a, a script he wrote. And then we've actually used Festival to call up and actually call your cell phone and then actually uh, speak the text of the uh, of the problem to. If you are interested in things like network management, not everyone is. I mean, it's a very it's a non sexy, somewhat. It's like being interested in oil changes on your automobile. No, but if you're if you're a sysadmin, it's one of those required things. You don't exactly. you don't want people coming to you and telling you something is broken. You want to know about it before they, they right, find out. preferably before they ever realize it's exactly. broken. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Um, and uh, and that's who we appeal to. And so if you're that type of mentality, um, OpenMS can be extremely rewarding. But it may take. Uh, uh, it may take some time. Now, we are trying to set up some UK-based training. So we, we looked at training facilities down near Borough Market. So if you keep your eye on the website, you may see within the next month or two some training. And a lot of people get uh, find it's, it, it's very advantageous. You get your brain, or like you're saying, getting your brain around that bit to just be knowledgeable enough to ask the right questions is sometimes harder. So where can people find out about that? What's the website? Well, OpenNMS, O-P-E-N-N-M-S dot org is the best place. Thanks very much, Joyce. Yeah, thanks for coming up and having us. Dave and I are here with Phil from Debian UK. Um, Phil, what are you doing here at the Expo? Uh, we're talking to the people as they wander past, looking rather bored and wondering why that they're in a little Linuxy bit when they thought they were meant to be in the Mac show, mostly. Are you getting lots of confused Mac rejects, then? Yeah, it's quite a few. Uh, although, just had a bloke uh, wanting to do desktop publishing for a charity going, so what's this about? And I think he may end up using Debian. So we do get a few people come back and say, you told me to use Debian five years ago, and now I've converted all my computers to Debian, and it's really wonderful. So uh, the the, uh, the returning folks are very encouraging. And coincidentally, the Debian stand and the Ubuntu stand are, are back to back in, in the Expo Hall here. Yeah. Um, and so we can shove a huge knife through the uh, the partition wall. <laughs> Well, De De Debian and Ubuntu have got a bit of a strange relationship at times. I mean, everybody who's on the stands is getting on really, really well, but um, sometimes there, there are some tensions and stuff. What's the relationship between Debian and Ubuntu? So well, it's a derived distribution like a whole bunch of other distributions. Uh, Zandros is one, uh, Linspire, I think. Uh, the stuff that's on the EPC, that's uh, a Debian uh, thing, and most of the other distributions. Uh, derived distributions are less involved with Debian than Ubuntu is, so 
I don't see how anybody can complain about it really. So what are the strengths of Debian? Why does it make it so good for deriving other distributions from it? It was sort of set up in order to stop the Unix wars that broke up Unix in the past and the intention was that people derived off Debian and because there's no company there's no, you know, the problem that Mandrake had uh, deriving from Red Hat was in part because Red Hat don't need the competition and would uh, act to frustrate Mandrake's uh, wishes whereas there is no reason why Debian would want to frustrate derivers because it's the more the merrier as far as we're concerned. So am I I'm right in saying Debian doesn't actually have a financial backing? I mean, for example, Ubuntu, um, some of the developers are paid by Canonical to actually work on it. Um, so Debian, none of the developers are actually paid by anybody? It's all, it's all free well, and open? Most of our developers are paid by someone. Just <laughs> <laughs> yes. And some, pe- some people are paid specifically to work on Debian because the company that they work for uses Debian so much that it's worth having some of their internal developers spending time on making sure that the operating system they use is worthwhile and they see that it's cheaper to do that than it would be to go and hire someone else to maintain some other operating system. Debian is powered by enlightened self-interest. People may think that we're all altruistic, but basically, the, the, I, you know, I make my living out of selling Debian support. I'm quite unusual in that. Uh, most Debian people don't actually make money out of Debian directly in any way at all. The, pe- the people behind Debian don't actually have a financial interest as such when they're actually making choices about what goes into distribution. They're not, they're not subjected to sort of commercial pressures, I guess. Yes. Yeah, we don't have a marketing department, as you can probably tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, if there was a marketing department, they might have said something about your kilt that you're wearing. <laughs> Yes, well, this is uh, the Debian Tartan, of course. Oh, right, OK. So how, why is it the Debian Tartan? Because it spells Debian in Morse code. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, the white stripes, dash dot dot, that's D in Morse code, dot E, dash dot dot dot, B, dot dot, I, dot dash, A, dash dot, N. I think we'll have, I think we'll have to get a photo of that to put on the <laughs> podcast page, won't we? Yeah. So you're not actually Scottish? Not even slightly. You, you just like wearing skirts? Yes. <laughs> it's an excuse not to wear any underwear. It's rather nice. Uh, we won't test that theory, I think. So what is coming up for Debian? What's um, the next release? When's that due? <laughs> when it's that, ready. That wasn't a loaded question, I promise you. When it's ready. When it's ready. Um, when is it likely to be? Well, at DebConf there were 600 release critical bugs. I think we're down to about 100 now. Uh, Debcom for us in August so if you, if you believe in uh, plotting graphs and things uh, the thing is that we can obviously get rid of all the release critical bugs by removing all those packages that have got release critical bugs so if someone gets fed up enough with it not releasing then it'll just be well all those packages are out because almost all the release critical bugs are now not in uh, vital packages so we'll just be missing a few packages and if people need them they can get it from unstable instead of or testing which is the, the uh, we have in Debian we have uh, unstable testing and stable and the stable releases are not like Ubuntu every six months there when we managed to beat it into shape which I think probably has averaged about every 18 months over the years uh, we're doing a bit better now there have, have been occasional releases that took pretty much forever well when Ubuntu was making its first releases it was at the time that Debian was uh, had a, quite a long gap between stable releases that was sort of I think that was one of the motivations behind Ubuntu originally uh, where people were fed up with having stable being three years out of date is there anything the Ubuntu guys could be doing more to actually aid the Debian project because obviously it's mutually beneficial I think I mean some of the friction that does exist between uh, individual developers is mostly about the idea that things are being patched in Ubuntu and patches aren't being pushed back into Debian. I, th- I think normally that's um, a misperception. So some people got quite uh, vocal about uh, GCC differences and. That was actually because Ubuntu and Debian make different decisions about when to do binary incompatibility uh, transitions. And if you'd put the the patches that people were talking about at the time back into Debian, it would have broken everything. And the people that were deciding not to push it back into Debian knew that and were maintaining both packages in, in both Ubuntu and in Debian. So 
you know, if it's the same person doing it, then you can't really justify a complaint about not pushing the patches back. Yeah. You'll find more of a fight between the users uh, because they're tribal then you do the, the developers are all down the pub having a drink and then you've got this war outside where the, the users are going Debian's rubbish or Ubuntu's rubbish or Red Hat's rubbish or in Ubuntu uh, we come up with uh, version numbers and our code names so for example Hardy Heron um, you know and, and, and names like that now I understand Debian also has similar names what's your naming scheme and how do they get picked uh, they get picked by the release managers uh, but they, they get picked from a dwindling pool of names of characters in Toy Story 1. So we've pretty much run out of names. Uh, annoyingly, uh, from my point of view, um, RC Buggy, the radio-controlled buggy, has, <laughs> has recently been used as a, a link to uh, one of the uh, unstable, to, to Sid, the unstable uh, distribution, or, oh no, experimental. I think RC Buggy is now a code name for the experimental uh, repository which means that we won't be able to use it as a release name because I thought making the next release... Debian call, Buggy. Uh, yeah, De- Debian RC Buggy oh, <laughs> would yeah. have been really great, but you know, other people thought it might be misinterpreted somehow. <laughs> so what do you do when you run out of Toy Story 1 characters? Uh, I guess we'll probably move to Toy Story 2. And, and why Toy Story? Uh, because Bruce Perrins, who was the project leader at the time, worked for Pixar, and... Pixar makes toy, made Toy Story at the time, so he was working as a sysadmin in Pixar, not actually on the film, but keeping the systems running at the back end. And uh, so that's how it started. Uh, where does the name Debian actually come from? Uh, that's uh, Ian Murdoch is the Ian bit, and his wife Deborah. So it's a bit like this sort of blue strip across the top of a Ford Escort. <laughs> it's rather embarrassing, but I quite like the, the name. It's uh, it's worked well, but its uh, origin is a bit. Dire, really, I would guess. <laughs> so Debian is the it's Ford Deb- Escort Deb- distribution. Debian. Yes. <laughs> the distribution for Ford Escort drivers. <laughs> Where can they find out more about Debian? Uh, Debian.org, or you can. I, I run the UK Mirror, which is www.uk.debian.org. So if you, you're downloading stuff, it's more efficient to do it from there than from uh, anywhere else. Uh, I mean, Ubuntu users are generally using Debian sort of, sort of uh, directly <laughs> for, from the universe and multiverse stuff is pretty much what Debian is. Excellent. Thanks very much, Phil. All right. Cheers. Time for the competition result. And in the last episode, we asked you how many of our £20 canonical shop vouchers it would take to buy the DB2 IBM support thingy from the canonical shop. Um, now, we had about 30 answers, and they were all correct, um, some of you added one way or another. <laughs> yeah, some of you added VAT and some of you didn't. Um, but Laura's got the winner. It's Willem or Willem Lichtenberg. Congratulations to you, and we'll be emailing you the details of the voucher, which was the prize. Apparently, we actually forgot to say when we set the competition what the <laughs> prize was. But uh, given that it was a prize about twenty pound vouchers for shop.canonical.com. It should have been fairly obvious that that was what the prize was. We haven't got a competition to set in this episode, but listen to the next episode when we'll be setting a new competition for something probably equally as exciting. This has been a bit of a special episode with all the content from the expo, so we're not going to uh, read out your feedback this time around, but we'll have a lot in the next episode. However, you can still get in touch with us via the usual means. Um, Send your suggestions or material, tips, rants, reviews to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash EUPC or identica at identi.ca slash EUPC or you can join us on IRC on the Freenode network at hash ubuntu-uk. Find us on Facebook, search for Ubuntu UK Podcast or leave us a voicemail on 0845 508 1986. And thank you very much once again to all of our mirrors. So that about wraps it up. It's been a good couple of days, I think. How have you found it, Alan? Yeah, it's been quiet, but um, 
yeah, it's been good fun, and we've had a bit of banter with the uh, Debian guys who've had the stand behind us. We've been giving out advice about Debian, and they've been giving out advice about Ubuntu. It's been good. There were some reasons for where Debian might have been more suitable, and I, I know I pushed at least one person to go that way. And we've had Ubuntu installed on a, uh, a PC from the stand opposite us, TransTech. We got their wiped their SLES install and put Ubuntu on there. And uh, the VMware guys wanted to run Ubuntu inside their VMware product on macOS, I think. Yeah, I, w- I was just walking past them, and they said, "Hey, can we uh, can we have a Ubuntu CD so we can try?" running Ubuntu to show off and I thought hey great showing off Ubuntu on a Mac go for it it's also worth mentioning that Drobo are here as well for our obligatory Drobo mention in this episode so uh, if they do it again next year it would be good to see um, more people from the loco helping out there have been quite a few people here um, but it's always good to have more hands it's been interesting seeing the mixture of Mac people and Linux people and we've had loads of Mac people come over so it's like a whole new audience really you don't get at a just Linux event Mm. the uh, yeah the uh, Mac people seem to have that kind of affinity with us I don't know if it's an anti-Microsoft thing or pro choice thing but the Mac people come over as, as quite friendly and they've been interested in running Ubuntu on their Macs and also on you know PCs they might have it's funny because they seem to a lot of them seem to want to relegate PCs to to running Ubuntu now they've migrated on to running the Mac one thing that's also been quite nice is there's been uh, members of the actual Ubuntu community have come up and said hey you know I know you you know I know you online I think what's your name ah yes I know who you are as well so that's been really good yeah, we've had podcast listeners and people who sit in our IRC channel and people who just know us through support and stuff well join us next time thank you goodbye bye bye bye